Bushido is the world's toughest form of hand-to-hand -hand combat. It pulls in the world's biggest live audiences for any form of wrestling. Few bouts go the distance. This wrestling is for real. Competitors give and take ferocious blows to the head and body. It combines the best of judo and karate, sambo and kickboxing. Never before have fighters in these different disciplines challenged one another in the same ring. The UWFI, the sports governing body, has strict rules and regulations. You're allowed to use your forearm, but you must not use the point of your elbow. You can slap, but you cannot bite, scratch or headbutt. Headbutting is illegal. When your opponent is on all fours, you cannot kick to the head. But as soon as one arm is up in defense, a kick to the head is allowed. When your opponent is on all fours, the rest of the body is a legitimate target. If a foul is committed, then points are deducted. Four points are conceded when a suplex throw results in a referee's count. Three points are lost for any knockdown, and one point is deducted for a suplex throw. Fighters can escape any submission hole by touching the rope, but they then concede a point. A submission at any time ends the fight. This is the Korakuen Hall in Tokyo, the spiritual home of the Japanese martial arts. The sport's number one crowd puller, Nobuhiko Takada, is out of action tonight, but the 2,500 crowd are all happy to pay their respects to their hero as they file in to see a bill that includes five top-class fights. On the bill tonight, two junior fighters, Kanehara and Maeda. There's Tom Burton from the USA against Kakihara. Nakano takes on another American, JT Southern. Then the all-Japanese bout between Miyato and Tamura. Topping the bill, the tag match, Yamazaki and Anjo against Albright and Boss. Japan against the USA. First up, though, the youngsters, Kanihara and Maeda. <laughs> Azakazu Maeda from Tokyo, only 18 years old, but he's six feet tall, weighs 194 pounds. He's met Kanihara before. Last time they drew, there's everything to prove. Hiromitsu Kanehara of Tokyo, 20 years old, 5'11", 198 pounds. In that first fight, he was ahead on points at the end of the fight, but didn't have the three-point lead needed to clinch the win. Your commentators, American technical expert Ted Pelk and five-time world karate champion Jeff Thompson. So Kanehara in the red corner, Maida in the blue corner. Ted, what's the form on these fighters? Well, this is the rematch. They, they're, they've they been with the UWFI for a year. They've been training for a year, and they got their first chance. They both had their debut match against each other in their last fight, which ended up in a time limit draw, which is very unusual for the style. You rarely see people go the distance in the style, but it did. It's kind of hard to say what this fight is going to be all about. This is the second time they're both fighting. This is the rematch, like I've said, and... Seeming, seeming to favor a more stand up and, and um, trade it approach. For Maeda, I think he's definitely at the advantage standing up and working off strikes, heel strikes and kicks and knees. For Kanehara, who looks like he has a slight weight difference, he, sh he should be more comfortable. At least from what I saw last fight, he was much more comfortable on the ground. He should want to keep Maeda on the ground. Kanehara seen here in the green trunks, Maeda in the white trunks. Ted, for our first time viewers, a little bit about the rules. Okay, um, when you get someone, the main point in UWFI style fighting is to knock out somebody, TKO him, or make him give up. What Kanehara is trying to do right now is make Maeda um, submit. He's looking for an opening. He's 
trying to get a submission hold on him. Now they're standing up. And once you get in a submission hold, you have to either give up or escape to the ropes. If you escape to the ropes, the referee will break it and you'll lose a point. But the action continues. And the wristbands also help identify the fighters when they get a little bit more into the rough and tumble on it. Yes, the re during a submission hold, uh, the referee will show a shoot sign. And Okanahara is going for a belly to back German suplex. He takes him over. And Maida loses a point for that. That was a beautiful suplex. He really had a good arch on it. Oof. Right on the back of the neck. It's a really deadly move. Many times the bout just stops that you can knock, you can actually knock out your opponent with that. And as I said earlier, they seem to favor the toe-to-toe -to -toe approach, but they're actually getting on to some of the ground technique, which is quite quite um, unique about this type of fighting. Might is going for like a straight arm bar right now. But not very lucky. Kanahara looks like he's trying to suplex him again. I would say, I mean, Kanahara obviously looking to now capitalize on his, weight, his obvious weight advantage. Well, when they're, uh, they're on the ground, from what I've seen so far, Kanahara de definitely has the advantage over Maeda. As you can see right there. Now, Kanahara looking for opening. He's going for that, um, st that straight arm, the cross lock on the arm. If he can break that grip, he's in pretty good position. He's in the middle of the ring. It would be tough for Maeda to escape to the ropes at this point. But he does. Escapes to the ropes into the sanctuary. And he loses a point for that, and he looks in trouble. That cross lock is very deadly, the cross lock on the arm. This Maeda looks none too pleased at the moment. His left hand heavily strapped. Do you think that have any effect on the overall uh, decision or outcome? I don't know, but um, in the last match they had together, uh, Maida actually broke his finger. I don't know that how that's going to affect. He's just throwing some knees right now. He's actually throwing some pretty good um, face laps. So um, his wrist obviously not worrying too much. Yeah, he actually broke his fingers in the last match throwing um, heel strikes. And that's why you see his hand taped up. But Kanahara seems to have the advantage here in the green trunks. Actually looking to pin Maida down and keep him, keep him from getting up on his feet. Maida reverses it. Kanahara was going for a face lock, but he might have slipped out. And now he goes for the leg. Now he's trying to apply an Achilles tendon hold, but he's in a bad position. And Kanahara has an Achilles tendon hold on him. This is kind of like a stalemate. And you see the referee doing the double shoot sign with both his um, right hand and left hand. The right hand signifying the red fighter in the red corner and the left hand signifying the fighter in the blue corner. And Maida loses another point for escaping in the rope. So Kanahara looking for the submission there but not actually getting it. Maida making it to the ropes and for sanctuary. T tell us a little bit about the junior the junior fight structure. I mean, do these fighters compare? Can they hold their own with the, the greats like Takada and Yamazaki and the others we've no, seen? No, these boys aren't ready to be with the senior division like with Takada, Yamazaki or those kind of fighters. Actually, th this is their second fight and um, the younger guys and the smaller guys form what's called the junior league. And that just means the new up-and-comers who are not ready for the big time yet, but they will be. It's like tomorrow's stars and they try to work their way through the system and basically what you got to do is just chalk up all those as many wins as you can okay so serving the apprenticeship and they certainly look to be doing that tonight and like we've said before these boys have to do everything in the gym and they're looking to graduate from the junior league so to speak so they can be in the senior league so very much the other martial arts, they do have a, a, almost a rank system. Yes, they do. And the younger ranking boys, like we've said before, they have to do all the, run all the errands of the gym. They have to do the cooking, the laundry, the cleaning, in addition to their training for the older and more experienced fighters. So they're all looking, uh, they're really anxious to chalk up a whole bunch of wins and graduate from that division. I think you can see this here with mine. They're actually opening up here on Kanahara. And he's throwing some and he's beautiful there. knees. Oh. I mean, that's a very good combination there. Three. Oh, fine. Kanehara just lost three points for that knockdown. Th those were a beautiful series of knees. Yeah, we're seeing it here in slow motion. I mean, Maida really loosening up on him. And actually, when he took him down, he actually, it wasn't from a knee. He actually grabbed him by the neck and threw him down. 
might have seen Simi taking the edge here, but... Kanehara takes him over in a front neck chancery drop, and he tries to get him with a sleeper hold. He's looking for an opening on the neck. Yeah. Singh actually with the younger fighters a bit more of the facial expressions of pain. Well, these are young boys. Right now, um, Maida going for a straight arm bar. Be interesting to see as, as junior fighters just how they do hold out when it comes to the submissions. As they say it's an experienced old mind that can handle the pain. Yeah, it's becoming very evident that Kanehara is definitely the dominant one on the ground. Yeah, I'd have to agree with that. I mean, uh, Maida looks in a fair bit of pain there at the moment. And it'll be interesting to see as to whether Kanahara actually takes advantage of his injured um, wrist to good effect. Kanahara in the green trunks, Maida in the white trunks. Kanahara is going for a single leg Boston Crab right now. Yeah, that's a Garda special that was done with such poise and um, enthusiasm. Maida is in not so much trouble. He looks, oh, but um, right now, um, this could be it. Kanahara, maybe he's possibly going for the STF. But <laughs> Maida makes it to the ropes and to the strong applause of the crowd. But he still looks in trouble as we see here in the replay. STF means it, it's just a step over toe hold with a face lock and STF is kind of like the initials for it I'm sorry I asked <laughs> but here we see Maida right down with a few kicks as we say really all round technique and ability coming to play here the junior showing good technique Kanehara can't just sit there and defend himself he's going to have to do something offensive what Kanehara do, has to do to win this match is to keep Maida on the ground he's having trouble standing up Maida looking to protect his, his, his injured wrist. Maida should be trying to stay away from Kanehara. He should be circling him. As soon as he gets up, he shouldn't be caught. He shouldn't let Kanehara grab him in a clinch and take him down to the ground. He has to continually work off heel strikes, palm strikes, knees, kicks, and just keep on continually moving around him. Even if he has to let Kanehara take control of the ring, he shouldn't let himself be on the ground. He's, at a, he's in a very dangerous position right now because Kanehara is just looking for an opening. And he's, yeah, he's taking that arm bar. He, he lost it, but he almost had it there. Kanehara looking to press on the advantage and might have definitely in trouble here. Be interesting to see if he can hold on and make it to the ropes. Once you apply a submission hold, there is no way of escaping. There's no way you can, if it's properly, properly executed, there's no way of escaping. The only way you can get away from it is to escape to the rope and you lose one point or by just giving up and that's the end of the match. I mean, yet again, for our first time, we will be somewhat surprised when a fighter makes it to the ropes and seeing an appreciative um, Japanese crowd. Do you want to explain the philosophy behind that? Yeah, the um, Japanese crowd is really educated. Ooh, ooh. Oh. Did you see that knee? Yeah. Oh. Beautiful knee to the solar plexus midsection area. Three. Kanahara is Four. definitely in trouble as he takes Five. his count. And Maida's actually ahead in point, is ahead by one point right now. And you know, oh, nice. Flying knee strike. And he's take, trying to take him over. He really didn't bridge that well on that one, but he did get a suplex point, and Kanahara loses a point for that. Kanahara with eight points, Maida with ten points. You noticed when um, Kanehara and Maida were up, Kanehara was actually trying to throw a whole a series of kicks on Maida, but he was defending him very well. And this one looks interesting. Kanehara seems to have the advantage here with Maida. He yeah, he got the cross lock. It's a cross lock on the leg, and he loses a point for escaping the rope once again. Score eight to nine. That looks as though it could have, it may well have been up for Maida, but he seems to make it there yet again. It's amazing, we, do, we, do, we seem to see explosive oh. first, but yet again. Now they're even again. Eight points each. Kind of hard to take Smite over in a belly-to-belly -belly front suplex. Ooh. Basically what he's trying to do is not only is he trying to hurt him with a suplex, basically the main point of that is to try to take the man down to find an opening for a submission hold. And 
once again, Kanahara on the ground. Obviously, the dominant wrestler gets, catches Maeda on another submission hold and forces him to escape to the rope. He, that, that was what was called the triangle hold. Eight points to seven, you just saw the, the score. And for those first time viewers, the scores actually go down. So we see a, a, a sliding scale going down to zero, starting with 15 points, as I said. And here, the guy goes Bum. for those kicks. Bum. Five points to seven. Three, this is getting very four, close. Five, this is another one of those classic matches, which is like the striker versus the wrestler. And Ryder right looking to press up an advantage here. Both looking a little tired. Too. 30 seconds left in the bout. Somebody's going to have to do something to win this. The score is 7 to 5, and you have to be winning by three points to be awarded the match. And this is. Kind of had his last chance. He has that single leg Boston crab on Maeda. And it looks like desperate measures for Maeda to try to get his legs. Can he afford another? And no, no he can't. What Maeda has to do, he just has to sit for the rest of the match. He has 10 more seconds to go. If he escapes to the ropes or gives up, that'll be the end. Kanahara will win. But he manages to survive. And the rematch ends up in a draw again. Looks like we're going to have to have another rematch. <laughs> As you see here, there's a lot of effort going in by these junior rank fighters. Another draw between these two promising young fighters, Kanihara and Maeda. We'll be seeing a lot more of them in the series. Next up, America's Tom Burton takes on Masahito Kakihara of Japan. Tom Burton from Florida in the USA, 32 years old, 5 foot 10, a big man, a big personality. There's his record, four fights, only one win, but he's beginning to make quite a name for himself with the Japanese fans. <laughs> Masahito Kakihara from Ehime, 21 years old, 6 feet tall, 195 pounds. He's younger than the American, but he's taller and lighter. He's had a long layoff through injury, and he's on his way back. Two fights, one win, one defeat. That's Masahito Kakihara. Kakara fighting out of the red corner and Tom Burton fighting out of the blue corner. This is Kakara's second fight since he's come back after that serious injury that he had against when he fought Tamura and he snapped his Achilles tendon and has been out of action for a while. Certainly showing no ring rust there in the opening few flurries. I mean, Tom Burton adapting well to this style of fighting. A favorite with the crowd? Well, they appreciate the fact that he keeps on coming back for more, and um, he is slowly developing his own style. You mean everyone's pulled Bull Makiwara? Yeah, um, Tom Burton, he has a lot more to learn, but he's, he's come a long way since his first visit to the UWFI. But and definitely tonight he has his weight advantage against Kakiara. And wrestling skill. But then again, Kakiara's last fight against Jim Boss, Jim Boss had a weight advantage too, and we saw what happened there. That's right. Kakiara with a stunning knockout, a kick to the head, and when Jim Boss was on his way down, he actually dislocated his shoulder when he hit the ground. Tom Burton in the black singlet, Kakihara in the black trunks. Kakihara should be throwing more um, punches and kicks in this situation. He shouldn't be trying to grapple with Burton because that's definitely Burton's advantage. But um, Burton seems to have adapted well to the ability to stand up and trade with the palm strikes and a few kicks and what have you. Yes, he's actually blocking much better, you've noticed, than his first couple of fights. His defense has improved greatly. And now he's going for a leg breaker. And Kakiara trying to look for a face lock. The armbands on the wrists helping the referee to decide when they really do get entangled, exactly who's got the upper hand. And you see referee Wada is doing the shoot sign with his left hand, signifying the fighter coming, fighting out of the blue corner. Points level at 14 points each. 
starting with 15 points and working down to zero. This is going to be a tough fight for Takihara. Yes. Going up against all that strength and that extra weight. And a very purposeful look from Tom Burton. He looks as though he's adapted and he looks really set to try and make his mark in this, in this, in this type of fighting. And as we've said before, his defense against the punches and kicks are much better. He's really improved on his defense. Let's see how his, his offense is doing. Well, he seems to have the advantage here as he, get, he gets Kakihara on the floor and goes to work on him. But Kakihara gets an ankle hold on him and actually makes Tom Burton escape. He scored 14 points to 13. That just shows you with submission holds, it doesn't matter how big or small your opponent is, if you if you can grab a vulnerable point like a wrist, an elbow, or a, an ankle, you can make a, a, any man submit. Oh, I'd have to go along with that. I mean, they always said no matter how big the guy is, once he's hitting the joint, he'll go down. You noticed a little bit earlier, Tom Burton was trying to go for a full Nelson, but he couldn't apply the pressure, and Kakiara managed to slip out of that. Burton's showing good technique here. Quite impressed compared to the last few bouts in which we've actually seen him perform. He seems to be really hanging in there. You see, since his defense is so much better than it was before, he can actually defend against those punches and kicks and move in. He shouldn't be actually trying to throw punches and kicks because that's not what he's good at. He's a good wrestler. But now that he knows how to defend against the strikes much better, he can move inside, clinch his opponent, and take him down and do what he's best at, which is wrestling. <laughs> Looked as though he was actually trying to reach out to the hand of the referee there, but it was for the ropes. Yeah, um, Kakara actually had another ankle lock on him. Some of these ankle locks are very deceptive because you wouldn't actually think that Burton was in trouble there. But like I've said before, with these submission holds, it doesn't matter how big your opponent is. It's not strength with submission holds. It's leverage. It's all leverage. It's not like a big bunch of muscle men twisting themselves around in pretzels. That's all leverage there. Well, that looks definitely like leverage because I tell you what, Burt made one desperate grasp for those ropes. And he almost had that um, Achilles tendon, but... They were too close to the ropes and Burton manages to escape again. Beautiful right to the head. Actually, he just managed he tapped him with his instep. That would have been um instant. it would have been much more powerful if he could have hit him with his shin. Tom, I don't think that was a tap. I think that was Burton's if resilience. You check, yeah. That, that, that really stunned him bad, but it would have been he might have been able to knock him out if he hit him with a shin. Spinning crescent kicks, the lot are coming out. But it had no effect on Burton. It hit him in the shoulder. And now Burton going for the double leg Boston crab. Kakihara looking to open up, but Burton showing that resilience that we've all become to know and respect from him. Kakihara shouldn't really shouldn't take any chances. But he reverses it and he gets that heel hold on him. Burton making for those ropes, and that can be affecting the overall score as we're seeing now. Kakahara leading 14 points to seven. Kakahara's leading by seven points. It's amazing with most of the point scoring that does take place in most competitive bouts of martial arts that we're now seeing a system that is totally reflective of all of them. The straight leg bar. He's applying pressure on the Achilles tendon once again, and Burton escapes again, and now the score 14 to six. Yeah, definitely looks in trouble here. Burton seeming to have trouble with those seemingly painless locks that Kakihara's putting He's on in him. pain, he's having trouble with his um, ankles right now, and once you lose your footing, you're in pretty bad trouble. Burton was deflecting quite well, and I mean, that type of, of flurry that Kakihara's just put on him does drain the energy. Do you think that'll be a factor? Oh, it'll definitely be a factor. You can tell that Burton's having trouble walking right now. Once you take out like a foot or a leg, that's really to your opponent's advantage. You don't want that to happen to you. Well, Kakihara looking in trouble here. And Burton making the ropes, but not in the fashion he normally expects to. You may have noticed now in this fight, although Burton is definitely the dominant wrestler. But yet again, there you see it. I mean, seemingly to have the advantage. Kakihara has is the dominant submission wrestler. He's, he's applying all the submissions, and every time Burton goes for a submission, he's managing to counter those submissions. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's a definite adva advantage in Kakihara's favor, and could well be the telling factor in this, in the outcome of this bout. He's actually coming out on top with the submission holds. Yeah, Burton's looking tired. I mean, the, the grabbing around the legs isn't purposeful. 
And now he has a front face lock on. This could be the end. Oof. But Burton takes him down. And whilst most of, most of you at home would see that as being quite intimate, I tell you now, that is a very, very painful exchange taking place between these two fighters. Now Kakara going for the cross lock on the arm. If he can flip Burton over, he might have it, but Burton looks a little bit too heavy to be able to flip over for Kakara. Shoot sign being signaled there. Which is signifying that Kakara's in trouble. Tom Burton has a submission on his leg. And now, once again, Kakara reverses it, gets a sleeper hold and makes Burton escape. Score 14 to four with Kakara in the lead. So yet again, it, always doesn't, it doesn't always have to be the hand that makes it to the ropes, as you can see there. Is it any part of the body, Ted? Any part of the body. It can be your hands, your feet, your head, any part of the body. If you can manage to go to the ropes, then they'll break it. Well, in almost gladiatorial style, they just fend off head to head. Oh, sleeper hold by Burton. I mean, is that, that sleeper hold is actually, does mean lights out. I mean, you can black out with that hold. Oh, you, you definitely. Well, once again, Kakara is slipping out, and he countered it beautifully. You see referee Wada with a shoot sign signifying Burton in trouble. All Kakara needs is one more knockdown. He's down to three points. This has been a pretty polished performance by Kakihari. I mean, he's had his strategy. He's stuck to it, as you see here. Nearly going for the big win as well. This is incredible performance, considering the circumstances. Kakihara has only lost one point in the bout. He looks in trouble now, though. Yeah, he looks a little tired. I think it was that last sleeper hold that's bothering him. He must have choked him really good. Look, Kakihara giving a good account of himself. I mean, you know, second bout back after injury. Doesn't seem to have lost any of the old style and flair he was showing. No, and in this point he has such a comfortable lead, but then again in this style you never know what happens. You can be leading by all the points in the world, and one submission hold in the middle of the ring if you're caught with one knockdown, knockdown, and that could be the end of the bout. Kakahara there losing his second point in this bout as he makes it to the ropes. And you notice Kakihara is really not rushing in or anything. He knows he has a comfortable lead on points and he's no, in no immediate danger. Oh. Well, uh, there was danger there as he as took him down. Exploded. And there's three points. Burton's Two, trying to catch up. Three. As you say, four, it's an exciting end to this bout. Kakihara looking in trouble. And look at this one. Yeah, he just takes him down. That's that. That's the weight difference. That's Burton's weight advantage that he just took him down with. Take that on forearm strike. I mean, palm strikes here rapidly being thrown out by Kakihara. Burton just dumps him. Burton with a double leg Boston prep. He's in. There's no way he's going to get out of that. Kakihara leading by seven points, but Burton just reverses it with that double leg Boston prep. Beautiful. Look at that arch. There's no way Kakihara's going to get out of that. Well, Burton's adapted as we see here the winner. A remarkable win. Well, this is a real shock for me. I was sure that Kakiara was going to take it, but it just shows you you can reverse it at any time. So, a shock win for Tom Burton, his second win in the UWFI. Next up, Tatsuo Nakano of Japan against JT Southern, another American. <laughs> J.T. Southern from the southern states of Tennessee, 28 years old, 6'2", 235 pounds. One of the characters on the circuit, but two fights, two defeats. Tatsuo Nakano from Ibaraki, 28 years old, a squat 5 foot 9, a massive 215 pounds, one of the most popular men on the circuit. Last time out though, hammered by the giant American Gary Albright, so still only one win in six outings. Your commentators once again, Ted Pelk and Jeff Thompson. In this fight, we have Nakano in the red corner going up against JT Southern in the blue corner. 
Ooh, beautiful low kick. Well, Nakana seems to have opened his account and showing his intent here. A very, very intimidating low kick there to JT Southern. JT Southern tried to pick his knee up, trying to block that kick, but he was a split second too late, and Nakano pumped in a beautiful low kick. I mean, Nakano's one of my favorites. He seems to take all that punishment, provide so much entertainment, but we'll be seeing another kick there. But never seems to be a popular with the crowd. Yeah, he definitely is popular with the crowd. The crowd loves him because he never gives up. He just keeps on going and going, and he can take so much punishment, but he just keeps on coming back and trying hard, and they... they appreciate his fighting spirit. JT Southern seems to be taking the punishment at the moment. And um, well, that looks like a tap. In most deceptive to most home viewers because they say that hasn't hurt, but oh, believe me, I've oh, obviously oh, been through around the gym, five that minutes, does hurt. Five minutes past. JT Southern isn't too, doing too well against the striking. Uh, but a pretty good takedown there, and the card I seem to just turn over and say, well, get on with it, see what you can do to me. He's trying to go for the single leg Boston Crab, but you can notice, um, Nakano is bending his left knee and trying to defend. Once, if he manages to pull that left knee out and put his weight on Nakano's back, then Nakano's going to have to escape to the ropes or give up. But he seems pretty safe at this point. Nakano in his distinctive lightning-like black trunks and of JT Southern in the more, let's say, freedom-giving short trunks. JT Southern with the obvious height, height advantage, weight advantage, and reach advantage, but We've seen Nakano before. He's not going to give up to anybody. Height and weight means nothing. One of the only competitors I ever lost to was a light heavyweight and was only about five foot nine. And um, JD Southern's going for an ankle lock, but actually Nakano's looking for another opening so he can counter that submission hold. So to most viewers, there wouldn't seem to be too much happening there, but believe me, there's a hell of a lot of stress being placed on those joints. They're not resting right now. They're looking for an opening for the submission hold, and Nakano look like, looks like he's found one, and he's working on the ankle. Yeah, looking for that leverage, a double shoot sign being indicated there, just in top right-hand corner of the screen. But Nakano definitely has the upper hand right now. He's countered that beautifully, and it looks like JT Southern's lost his grip on his ankle hold. When they're on the ground, they're not looking for a breather. It's not because they're tired and they're trying to catch their breath or anything. They're looking for a submission hold, which could end the match at any given moment. And that's what they're doing right now. JD Southern's going for an ankle lock, and Nakano's looking to slip out and possibly counter that move and apply his own submission hold. I mean, I totally appreciate it. I remember actually j joining a judo class before I actually started karate, and a big guy just sat on me. And I didn't move for about a minute, but I tell you what, I've never been in so much pain. Oh, yeah, even in judo, when somebody slaps on a juji katame or the cross lock or something, that's it. Once they apply the submission hold and they get it per with perfect leverage, there's no way you can escape. Ooh, and he kicks him in the side of the head. And that one looks interesting. Carlos seems to get him to glance off of JT Southern. Yeah, seen the glance off. I don't know why it's bothering too much, but that was perfectly legal. JT Southern had both hands up, and you're allowed to kick the head when you're allowed to, when your hands are up and you're in defense position. Well, he takes the count, but he's in trouble. Nakano's going for the finish here. Yep. He's going for a full Nelson, full Nelson suplex right on the back of the head. This should be it. Oof. Right on the back of the head and a single leg Boston crab with a beautiful arch. Well, 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 Nakano may not win many, but he certainly enjoys it when he does. And so does this very appreciative crowd. Whoa. That was, that was amazing, that arch on that Boston crab. I'm surprised he didn't snap his back on that one. Next up, an all-Japanese contest, Yuko Miyato against Kiyoshi Tamura. Tamura! <laughs> Kiyoshi! Kiyoshi Tamura of Okayama, 24 years old, 6 feet tall, 200 pounds, a rising star on the circuit. Six fights, an impressive record there. Four wins, two defeats. Miyako Yuko! Yuko Miyato of Kanagawa, 30 years old, one of the veterans, 5'10", 200 pounds. Last time out, he got the better of America's Tom Burton. But look at the record, that's only one of two wins in his last six outings. This 
match has a 45 minute time limit. The last time these guys fought, Tamura won, but many said it was a mistake. Ooh, spinning back kick. Rolling Savato tries it again, but misses. I mean, Miyato, Tamura, two very impress impressive fighters. And I mean, there we go. I mean, Miyato for me really has got that balance. Seems to have all the technical karate fighting right, the strength of a wrestler. Oh, he's, he's really determined five. to win this time because Miyato is, has a, more of a senior rank in the gym than Tamura. Tamura's more of a newcomer and he has a lower rank, but the last fight they went up against each other, Tamura beat Miyato with a sleeper hole. Many said it was a mistake. It was this move that he won with, actually. And he's going to look he's going to repeat it again. He's looking for a quick win. He wants to repeat what he did. Many, um, everybody that I knew said that it was a mistake that Miyato, he shouldn't have lost last time, and he's looking to take back that loss. He's, they're both looking for a victory, and Tamura wants to show the world that, you know, that wasn't a mistake. I really beat him that time. Yeah, I mean, Tamura's one, certainly one of the up-and-coming stars and, and certainly impressed me last time around with his all-round fighting ability. Be interesting to see if great order actually holds in this bout. Miyato fighting out of the red corner. And he's going up against Tamura, who's fighting in the blue corner. Tamura is a wonderful ground wrestler, and he knows his submission holds. I mean, Miyato, in his, yet again, in his distinctive black um, tights, and Tamura in his red trunks. You know, um, Tamura's going for that sleeper holding face lock, but he reverses it with a shoulder lock. But then again, Tamura reverses it, and once again, he's going for that sleeper hold, and that's what he beat Miyato with last time, and Miyato's in trouble. Hey, this is exciting stuff. I mean, Tamura always seems to have the arrogance that most people misunderstand as being just simple fighting confidence, and we're seeing some exciting stuff here. Miyato not willing to give up. He's trying to re reverse it with a leg lock or an ankle lock right now. He's looking for an opening. Say the only thing about experience in, in the ring is that you know when the pain's coming in, you can possibly accommodate it a bit more. But that youthful vigor we're seeing from Tamura certainly seeming to have the upper hand at the moment. Both guys have to prove something tonight. Like I said, Miyato has to take back that loss. He has to prove that it was just a mistake that he lost last time, and Tamura has to prove that he really won on skill and technique. It was a mistake. Believe me, Ted, whenever you get in that ring, there's something to prove. It's too much at stake. So who, who do you think is going to win this fight? I've got to be honest, I, I like Miyato's overall technique, but Tamura, to me, impressed me in the earlier bouts I've seen him in. He looks as though he can spring a surprise. But Miyato, Miyato knows his wrestling too. He took Tamura over in a beautiful fireman's carry. Now he's trying to apply a neck lock. No shoot signs in evidence there. And now he's going for the clock head scissors, which is working on the neck. And yet again, just to, sh to show how how good about this is. Not many of them have made it to the ropes. None of them have sought sanctuary in this bout. No. And right now, Miyato has a nice three-point lead, but you know how quickly things can change. And you can actually be leading on points, but your opponent can take you out with a submission hold or knock you out in the last seconds of a match or something. As we saw earlier, and look at that. Beautiful double wrist lock by Miyato. He really twisted that back, and Tamura's in trouble now, though. Oh, well, that hurt. That hurt. And actually, we see a knockdown from a submission hold. That's very unusual. We don't see that too much. A knockdown from a submission hold. Yes, yeah, the first one I've certainly seen, and yet again. See, right there, he, he has the chicken wing arm lock right on there. Chicken and, wing arm lock. And he actually, he puts his foot on the ropes and escapes, but he had trouble after that. Well, there was no flying away from that. And Tamura seemed to want a bit of revenge after that little bit of pain inflicted earlier. Now he's going for a straight leg bar. Miyato in trouble. Oh, well, he made it to the ropes. Score 14 to 8 with Miyato in the lead. Yeah, as we see there, Miyato making no mistake. He knows his way around and finds his way to the ropes. Tamura once again looking for an opening, which isn't, which it really isn't going to be easy with Miyato. But he flips him over and goes for the cross lock on the arm. Beautiful move there. If he can break that grip. Another thing that's impressed me about these fighters is we're seeing Japanese fighters not scared to show some open expression. Most of Japanese fighters I've thought never seem to show any any pain. That was always the culture and traditional way. Well. It's kind of hard to hold yourself back once you're having your arm twisted. Oh, look, Tamura, it's, it was that, um, that double wrist lock earlier, the chicken wing arm yeah. lock. That would, it, the arm's obviously still bothering him. I saw him shaking it around. 
Well, exciting action. Be, see, be interesting to see who just actually does come out on top. Tamura, with his arm obviously hurt, he, he better worry about his defense because Miyato is so good at striking people in the head and any part of the body. Tamura has to continually keep his hands up when they're in a standing up position. Ooh, beautiful backdrop, takes him over. Cool. Down. And that's a down. One, two, three, yeah, Tamura looks in trouble four, there. Now Tamura five. has four points. Look at this backdrop, beautiful arch. Actually, he could have arched a little bit more and thrown him on the back of his head. That might have been the end of the match, but Tamura's back up. He's a tough customer, as we've seen before. Ooh, that's a good throw. From, look at that beautiful connection that he did. It, it was a fireman's carry. He was carrying the leg, and he goes for the Boston Crab. All in one, one flowing movement, and he's in trouble, and he, he makes Miyato actually escape to the road. And that looked pretty desperate stuff there, but both look in trouble here at this best moment in time. That flow of moves was beautiful from the fireman's carry to the single leg Boston Crab. It certainly must have been, certainly must have been hurting Miyato because he made for those ropes big time. And you notice Tamura's going for the legs. He's continually going for the legs. With the single leg Boston Crab, not only was he hurting his back, he was hurting Miyato's Achilles tendon hold. And right now, he applied the Achilles tendon hold. And once again, Miyato had to escape the ropes. And Miyato's in trouble. Yeah, but going back to the strategy, I think they could have well bring him out of that trouble. I think he's got to stay off the floor to make my view. Miyato's got to work some kicks right now. But he, oh. And they're in the middle of the ring this time. Referee Wada with a shoot sign against Miyato, and he gets oh. up. Achilles tendon hold. Beautiful. Well, as I say, you can't underestimate this guy. He certainly is a star in the future. Look at this. Look at this. What a beautiful Achilles tendon hold. Picture perfect. Miyato, well, having to hail the winner in Tamura. <laughs> Top of the bill now, Japan against the USA. Yamazaki and Anjo against Albright and Boss. Gary Albright, the big man from Montana, 30 years old, six foot four, and an astonishing 350 pounds. His tag partner, Jim Boss, Nashville, Tennessee, 35, 5'11, 225 pounds. Anjo Yoji! The Japanese pairing led by Kazuo Yamazaki from Tokyo, another veteran, 31 years of age, 6'3", 230 pounds, his partner, Yoji Anjo from Saitama, 26, 6 feet tall, 210 pounds. Your commentators, Jeff Thompson and Ted Palk. <laughs> and here we are in the main event, with a 60 minute time limit. And we see Yoji Anjo going up against Jim Boss, who dislocated his arm in his last match against Kakihara. Yeah, I mean, these tag team bouts always excite me, and we seem to have an East v West clash here. How do you think it'll, how do you think it'll, it'll shape up? I really don't know at this point what's gonna happen. I, I see the team fighting out of the red corner should be using their striking techniques, possibly their low kicks, to try to slow down their um, bigger and heavier opponents and stronger opponents. There's a pretty formidable team in Yamazaki and Anjo. But Boss and Albright have certainly excited us with their ability to adapt. You know what their strategy, in the red corner, their strategy ought to be not to let Gary in the ring. They should just take care. <laughs> what they should do is literally they should just keep the fight in their corner. They shouldn't be in their opponent's corner. They should keep the fight close to their corner and they should try to put away Boss as quickly as possible and not let Gary in the ring. I wouldn't let Albright in the ring, in the street, in a room. That is some formidable size. Look at him, just waiting to get in there. The three-time All-American amateur super heavyweight champion. Gary Albright. And he's devastating. We've seen him fight before. I. I wonder if there's anything that can stop him. 
Well, ah. as I've always said, I mean, Takada is the star, but I think Albright could well be ah. looking to nudge him as a Westerner coming in on what's obviously um, a Japanese domain. Time after time, I always say in the style, which is true, any smaller man can be any bigger man with a submission hold if he gets a weak point, but nobody's, nobody's been able to get to Gary yet. And as I've said, a big man with technique becomes even more formidable. Now, but actually Jim Boss is well versed in kicks himself. He, he has a third degree black belt in Taekwondo, so he's certainly no stranger to striking as well as being, as being a, a state amateur wrestling champion himself. Oh yes, it's very evident he's got that movement, the kicking ability. But right now, Ancho is going for the um, a cross lock on the arm. He doesn't really have good leverage, but he manages to make um, Jim Boss escape to the rope. But only one point in it. Oh, and Boss hangs over to the big man himself. And here comes Gary Albright. Boss looks in trouble right now from an old injury the, from last time when he dislocated his arm. I don't know how it's going to hold up. Gary shoving Anjo in the corner. Takes him over with a belly-to-belly -belly front suplex. 20 points each. And in tag, they count down from 21 points and stay into 15 points we see an individual bats. And Gary with that devastating face lock makes Anjo escape to the ropes. Yamazaki's asking Anjo if he wants to touch and he's not. <laughs> And look how well Gary's defending against those kicks. He's picking up the knee and blocking it. He's not blocking it with his hands, so his head isn't in danger. And he picks him up, takes him over. Ooh. Belly to back German suplex, and Angel's in trouble. That might be it One. right here. Good thing he looks out of it, and he's Three. a pretty steady competitor. Four. Right on the back of the neck with all of Gary's weight slamming back with that beautiful arch. One of the most devastating moves. Angel's in trouble. He better touch, yeah. And here we have... Yamazaki saying, come on, Albright, let's go. Beautiful German suplex. Uh, Yamazaki squaring off against Gary for the first time. He's actually going for a German suplex, and he takes him over. That was amazing. That wasn't a throw in this. He just got him off balance and bridge. Now he's going for the cross lock. It shows you with submission holds and suplexes, it's not strength, it's all leverage. Throw your hips into it, and you can throw anybody over. And the crowd really getting behind this David versus Goliath type confrontation here. And everybody's cheering on Yamazaki. They're going, Yamazaki, Yamazaki. And referee Wada has the shoot sign on Gary, which means that Gary's in trouble. Do you think we could see a major upset here? We might, he has it, but Gary manages to escape to the ropes. Beautiful cross lock. Then again, anybody can beat any larger man at any given moment with a submission hold if it's applied correctly. It's all leverage with the throwing and submission holds. We're Gary, trying to kick now. Which is your <laughs> but he takes him over quickly with those suplexes. You see how quick he is with that to reacting. Yamazaki and Anjo leading by five points. Yamazaki right now looking for an opening for the submission hold. He's going for a clock head scissors while Gary's trying to defend it. Actually, I don't think Yamazaki should be on the ground trying to wrestle someone like Gary. Not only his size and strength and weight advantage, but also his experience and uh, his excellent amateur wrestling credentials he has. If he can catch him with a submission like he almost did with the arm cross lock earlier, okay, but I think his best chance is to allow Gary to take control of the ring, but to continually cir circuit him like planets orbiting around the sun and continually just throw low kicks until he can wear him down. When he sees an opening, then he can move in for the submission hold. Otherwise, he shouldn't be wrestling with Gary. Isn't it amazing? We always spoke good strategy before he we went out for a fight in, in competition. As you can see, when it gets down to it, anything could happen. Gary's working on Yamazaki's knee right now. And you see referee Wada with a shoot sign going against Yamazaki. And Yamazaki rever reversing and working on his heel. He's got a, a heel hold. It almost looks like uh, an individual bout. I mean, yeah, Anjo and Boss just seemingly out of the action at the moment. Yamazaki obviously had the upper hand on that submission hold. And we see Gary escape to the rope. 
And we're back, and it's Anjo and Boss taking center stage. You know, he has like a modified single leg Boston Crab. He's putting his knee in his back and putting his weight and applying the pressure on the Achilles tendon hold. That is serious pain. And Boss is Boston. in trouble. Oof. He's going to have to escape to the rope soon. Showing great courage there because Boss is really hanging in there. Anjo really applying it. For how long he can hang in on there, I don't know. But he made it. No, no he, he's very close. But, uh, there. Hey. That took a hell of a lot of resilience there. But, but he's in trouble. That definitely took a lot out of him. Let me see it again. I mean, do you reckon he can recover from that? Anjo had that submission hold down for a long time. And as we saw the replay, we see the tag in. Beautiful kick by Yamazaki. <laughs> There's the two, two man approach on all black. They try and chop this massive tree down. Look at this, he just knocks him down. That's Wade. He's just pushing him around. Anjo in trouble. He goes yes. for the same move. Spinning back kick while Gary had his leg caught. He just picks it up and back on it. Back on the neck of the road. And Andrew's in trouble. This could be it. This could be it right here. Referee Wadi should be looking. He might even want to stop the bout right now. Yeah, I mean, a bit of a spinning kick, but all that was being affected. Here he game comes in. Right now. Running in with a forearm. Oh, no. Here we go again. I the, can't see him taking much more of this. The referee should stop it. I think the referee should stop it at this point. But he's actually allowing it to go. I'm just getting the count. This is normally the open match because Matt is tried. Nine. Ten. Albright wants him up. He wants him up. That's Nine. it. Look how many German suplexes Anjo took. There's no way he's going to get up from that. Look at this. That's what you see there. The third one he took tonight. And, out. and there we see the ring tag, Boss and Albright. And it looks like Boss has dislocated that arm again. Boss had indeed dislocated that arm, but there was no way that would dampen the celebrations for Gary Albright.